Hello, thank you and welcome to Breaking the Chains Africa. This is Honorable Odonga Oto. I'm a contemporary philosopher, I'm a historian, I'm a political scientist, I am a lawyer and a, a scholar who does research on issues of importance to the African continent. Today I'm going to talk about slave trade. Our grandfather 400 years ago for slavery and slave trade. They resisted picking of the African species and taking them to the European market. But today there is a phenomenon where the young men and women are swimming across the Mediterranean, are trying to get themselves into what I would call modern day slavery. So it becomes a philosophical issue to analyze as to why young men 400 years later are involving themselves voluntarily into slave trade, something our grandfather resisted. Now, when we talk of slave trade, back to our history, there are three kinds of slave trade. The first one is the Trans-Saharan slave trade. This involves taking Africans across the Sahara into North Africa, then into the Mediterranean, and then into Europe. We all, we all know that uh, uh, Spain, where I live, is the only European country bordering Africa. So that is where the slaves are taken. That is what we call the Trans-Sahara slave trade. The second kind of slave trade we had in the past was the Indian Ocean slave trade. This was also called the Arab trade. It was majorly common in East Africa, where they get Africans, take them to the Middle East, and then they end up in the Indian Ocean Islands, and then into India and later in America. That kind of slavery affected people majorly in East Africa. It is called the Indian Ocean trade. And that is how languages like Swahili was even developed. So the first time the trans-Saharan slave trade majorly affected people in West Africa. The third type of slave trade that me as a contemporary politician and historian is introducing and telling you is the Atlantic slave trade. This was majorly in West Africa and Central Africa. It was also called the Triangular Atlantic Trade where Africans were taken to the Americans. So these were the three major slave routes. But when we talk of slavery, there are two dimensions that we have to pay attention to. The first one was that there were Africans selling fellow Africans. There were Africans who were kidnapping Africans and selling them to the white man. That is one dimension. Then there was the second dimension of the Europeans coming into Africa and capturing Africans and taking them to Europe. So when you talk of slave trade, there was African selling a fellow African and a white man coming to capture Africans and take them for sale to the destinations I've, I've, I've mentioned. The white man feared entering deep into Africa because of malaria, because of smallpox, because of... Uh, Many sicknesses. So the African selling fellow Africans was the biggest kind and form of slave trade. And this is very important that we have to take note. So the question that remains is, why were Africans selling fellow Africans? And how is that different from today, where fellow Africans are running away from African governments and African continent into the European countries? Why? The question has to be answered. Now, as a philosopher, as a contemporary thinker, I would want to first go further deep down into the history of slave trade. By 1529, the Portuguese had taken the first slaves. By 1529, the first slaves arrived in Brazil. 1529. When they arrived in Brazil, the Africans were used for labor in sugar, cotton, 
in the farms at the time Europe was industrializing. That's what we call industrial revolution. For those of you and me who went through the European education, we even have songs we used to sing. Slave, slave trade in America, working day, day and night. Those are all anecdotes of slavery. In total, in a period of 400 years, 400 years, the white man took 12.8 million Africans out of the African continent. 12.8 million Africans left African continents forcefully in the name of slave trade. And out of the 12.4 million Africans, 2.4 million died on the way. Some were thrown in the ocean because of health conditions. I was in Togo. I went to Togo, I entered the caves where they were keeping the slaves. What an amazing experience. And in 1847, that is when the world started seeing slave trade as a bad vice on the African continent. So in 1847, 23rd August, when Britain passed a law abolishing slavery. That is when the campaign for slavery, abolition of slavery, started in the entire African continent. By 1847, the British Parliament passed a piece of legislation abolishing slavery. And many of the European countries apologized to the African, African governments what they did. United States apologized publicly. Denmark apologized. Netherlands apologized publicly. United Kingdom apologized to African governments for slavery. France apologized publicly. Wait a minute, even the African governments apologized to Africans for what their predecessors were doing. The Nigerian government publicly apologized. The government of Benin publicly apologized. The government of Ghana publicly apologized. Actually, even more interesting, the president of Benin, His Excellency, President Matthew Karekou, apologized to Africans for slavery. Actually, if I, if I may quote the word, of the president of Benin, he said, it is a shame and we regret it. So as I stated earlier, by 1847, the last slaves were freed. They were free because the white man, the Europeans, the Americans had seen that slavery was a very bad thing for, for a human being to treat a fellow human being like that. That is why on the 23rd August every year, UNESCO, UNESCO made it an international day for remembrance of the slavery. That is the same day that the British Parliament abolished slavery. So that is history, 400 years ago. So the question is, why are our young men struggling to go into Europe, something our grandfathers, our forefathers rejected. What is the problem in the African continent that the young people are going into Europe, into slavery? As of now, there are 36 million Africans in Europe and America. 36 million. At least during the slave trade days, you will carry one ivory trunk from Muscat to Zanzibar and they release you and give you the option of becoming a domestic servant. But this one of going to Europe, which I'll come to explain shortly. In the year 2015, 1.8 million young men, youth and women, crossed the Mediterranean Sea to go into Europe. 1.8 million. Those days, 1.8 million of our grandfathers were organizing to run away from Yao, to run away from Tipo Tip, to run away from Mansa Musa. In the year 2020, 5,000 youth had reached the Canary Islands. 
This is a 600% increase from what happened in 2019. So the philosophical question, the political question is, why is there a reverse trend? Why is there a reversed osmosis in relation to the movement of Africans back to Europe, something our forefathers fought? Why are we going 200 years backward to the time slave trade was abolished? Are we trying to say taking people into the Americas and Europe was a good thing that we are seeing now? That our grandfathers failed to see? And the route is there. From West Africa, you go through the desert, Libya, into the Maghreb, you go into North Africa. When you reach North Africa, that is where some youths even try to swim into Europe. They get these boats and try to cross into, into, into Europe. So what is the problem? I live in Europe. I live in Spain. Spain is the first country that is receiving refugees or migrants. In Europe, there are now two perceptions of Africa. They are not calling them political refugees. They are also calling them economic migrants. That the young people are migrating into Europe because of better economic situations. So what is wrong with our governments? What is wrong with the African continent? Let me answer this. Our governments have failed. Who told you that transport, education, health should be privatized? Who told you that those industries should be run for profit? In Europe where I live, there is an efficient public transport system that is cheap and affordable. It takes me two hours to go anywhere in Spain. Underground, overground, bus, basing on choice. It costs two, two euros to travel a distance of up to 40 kilometers on well-organized government public transport. The health system in Europe functions. The governments in Europe have allowed the private sector to operate in the health sector, but that has not come as a substitute to the government hospitals. The public and government hospitals in Europe function. The same with education. Well, they are private sector. But the EU, the European Union, passed a law that there must be competition in provision of every services. So in education, people are struggling to take their children to government schools. In Africa, people are struggling to take their children to private schools. African governments have failed the citizens. That's why the youth feel that they should better go into Europe and get involved in those fine, kind of funny activities. Your governments have failed to add value to our products. A sack of coffee, a sack of coffee cost about 80 to 100 dollars everywhere in the African continent, in Ghana, in Togo. In Europe, a tin of coffee, Nescafe, costs 21 euros. So in Europe, to buy a tin of coffee, in Africa, it means to buy a sack of coffee. Value additions. Our governments have failed to add value. The same with cotton. We grow cotton in Benin, in Togo, in Uganda, in Kenya, in Sudan. Cotton growing countries. These cottons are shipped to Europe. And then they make clothing. One bale of cotton can cost about $300. Take it to Europe. When they take it to Europe, because the white man uses the brain, they make one cloth, one suit, and they bring it back to Africa. And you also buy it at $300. And yet that one bale of cotton can make 80 suits. Value addition. Our governments have failed. To add value addition. 
So the young men better feel they swim and go there. The next challenge is not only government. The next challenge is me and you. You watching me. There is what we call in political science demonstration effect. We watch movies in Hollywood and we want to behave like a white man. We want to demonstrate that we are them. You are suits. You brag. Made in Britain. You are wearing a perfume. Evening in Paris. You even go bragging in the local trade fairs. My socks is from London. You don't want to consume African products. This is where I thank the South African government. They have promoted the cottage industries. They have promoted the local industries. When goods are coming from Europe, they are heavily taxed. So that you buy South African shoes. And then now they have grown. We have Woolworth from South Africa all over Africa. We have ShopRite from South Africa all over Africa because the local industries have been promoted to produce products. What are your governments doing? Even your prime ministers and presidents are putting on clothes from Paris, from Britain. This is a betrayal of the African cause. I was in Morocco. I was so excited to see in Morocco the government have trained the youth to extract perfume from trees. Very important perfumes. But you'll find someone that uh, the perfumes I use is David of Cool Waters. So you are promoting those economies. And then how do you stop your youth from swimming to go where those products are? So our African governments should do a lot to invest in science and education. This is what Honorable Dongato is saying. Many of your governments cannot, your countries cannot even manufacture a needle. Even a needle. You can't manufacture a needle. We need to invest in science and education. If I may ask a question, why would a student going to study medicine at university, why would they pay tuition fees at the university? Why? Why would a, 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 a student going to study aeronautic engineering? Why should a, a, an engineer pay a, a, a fees at the university? Then how will science develop? In Europe, the moment they identify that someone has the required skills, they give you scholarship and you have free education. So we failed in promoting science education. And many of you government ministers, secretaries, permanent secretaries, you take your children to study in Europe because the education system in your countries have collapsed under your roof. There is unfair trade practice. Our government should negotiate better for the Africans in the World Trade Organization. Why should East African tea be auctioned and taken to Tanzania and Kenya and exported to Europe? A cup of tea in Europe, two euros, one euro sixty cents for a cup of tea. It's equivalent of about five dollars. Small cup of tea. And in Africa, a sack of tea is also the same 5,000 shillings. So we failed in, in value addition. So what should be done? There is need for a campaign for mindset change. I traveled to Ghana. I was so excited. Every Thursday or Friday, one of those days, I don't quite remember. It is a government policy that everyone should put on an African wear you get mesmerized and excited in Ghana. People go and design their African outfits. Other than putting on a, a European way of dressing and you put on a rope on your neck and you call it a, a, a necktie. Weird. In Europe, they put on that because in the weather, it's cold. You need to, to cover yourself. So we need to work on the minds of the African youth. To tell them that not everything that glitters in Europe is gold. We need to create opportunities. We need to invest in huge public transport, huge infrastructures. This is where you should question your governments. If we don't do that, then the second phase of slavery has just started. Our young children are lining up every day at the embassies of different countries. 
every single day. Go and see the American embassy. You are lining in Ghana across the road for visa. The British embassy across the road for visa. The French embassy for visa. The Netherlands embassy for visa. And how much do you pay for those visas? You pay $100 per visa. So every single day, those countries make money from Africans. You have 1,000 applicants. They give three. All the other money, they save it. And then they give back to your government. That is aid and grant. The biggest revenue collection the Western world is making from the African countries is visa. You apply for visa. They market. Come to Australia. Come to London. Come to Europe. You keep applying. Then you go for the interview, you fail, you'd have contributed $300. So they are collecting $300 from about 14 million youth every year. And then they donate for you food. Refugee camp that the American government has given you food for people in the camps. You carry cooking oil named Made in America. It is the visa fees that your children are trying to go to those countries. So African governments, please wake up. This is the time for thinking. The critical thinking is if we don't invest in these social infrastructures, it will look more attractive for our children to go into the Western world. Thank you for watching. Thank you for clicking. Please like it, subscribe to my uh, channels, and uh, God bless you. Thank you.